What is up? Hello and welcome to episode 116 of Chairside Live. We have a good episode for you today. We've got part two of my interview with Dr. Lewis Malkmaker, and he's going to talk to us about Botox. And most of the time when we hear about Botox and how many dentists are learning to give Botox injections, um, you wonder whether or not, A, is it legal in my state? You know, B, what is it for? Is it just for aesthetic improvements? But uh, Lewis is going to talk to us about a couple other areas where it can be really helpful by decreasing uh, muscle activity. And he's got a really interesting way to deal with gummy smiles that has to do with Botox as well, as opposed to more of a surgical intervention. So we'll get a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Malkmaker later on. In the show today, we've got an interesting case of the week for you. You know, there's certain things in dentistry we do that should be simple and straightforward. Uh, the single unit crown certainly comes to mind, but there's times where a single unit crown can be more difficult. Uh, if it's the last tooth in the arch, a lower second molar, and there happens to be an occlusal interference there, that's going to be tricky. If it's a single central incisor, it's going to be difficult to make it match the natural tooth next to it. If there happens to be one there, that's going to be tricky. And the other tricky one that we see is when we're doing a crown underneath a partial, specifically underneath uh, a clasp. So we've got a tooth that's being clasped by a partial denture and now it needs a crown. And we need to make sure that the laboratory is able to fabricate a crown that hopefully you know, has an intimate adaptation with the clasp themselves so that the patient doesn't lose any retention going from a natural tooth to a crown on that class tooth. And so today, in our case of the week, we're going to take a look at some different ways to do pickup impressions uh, to give your laboratory a better chance at sending you back a crown and a partial, for that matter, that are going to fit together well and are going to work well for the patient. But before we get to both of those, we do have a viewer mail this week. And this is a dentist who writes in and says, Hi, Mike. Have you personally cemented any Bruxer veneers with um, Ceramer? I read that the official indications are for full coverage crowns, but I have a friend who says that he had some Bruxer veneers that wrapped around the inner proximals on the tooth and that he was going to try it. Do you have any experience with that? Thank you. Well, Ceramer, or Ceramer Crown and Bridge Cement, as it's formally known, uh, you'll notice it doesn't have the word veneer in there because veneers, for the most part, um, are not retentive preparations at all, and the restorations uh, need to be bonded into place. Now, of course, you could use Ceramer for inlays and onlays, so it's not like you can't use it just because it's Ceramer Crown and Bridge, but when you think about it, it is a Crown and Bridge cement, and it is truly cementation, uh, exactly the same as the resin-modified glass ionomers, like Rely Excluding Plus or Fuji Plus. These are all true cements where bonding doesn't take place, and it requires a certain amount of retention tension between the restoration and the prep itself. You know, a crown, for example, that's got uh, taller than three millimeters on the preparation and hopefully doesn't converge any more than maybe 10 or 15 degrees. That's going to be retentive enough where you can use any of those cements, including Ceramer, very convenient, very easy to use. But when it comes to a veneer, we're talking about taking, you know, a piece, a thin piece of porcelain and, and some gluing it, bonding it to a tooth like this, and there's not a lot of retention there. It's not unlike uh, taking a dime, for example, and bonding it to a wall. It's just flat surface on flat surface. And even if you wrap that inner proximally on the mesial and distal, as your friend suggested, that really doesn't add to retention. I mean, there's more area, more surface area for the cement to be in contact with the tooth, but we're really talking about retention that we're looking for here. And so that whole facial part of the tooth, of the preparation itself, to really truly get retention, we need an opposing wall over on the other side. You know, we've got to have two walls opposing each other to get retention, not just a single wall with nothing over here. And when you look at the shape, of course, of a maxillary anterior tooth, we've got the facial surface, but then we've got that big concavity on the lingual surface of that tooth. In fact, really the only place to get mechanical retention on an anterior tooth is when you look at the cingulum. So you're looking at maybe the gingival one third of tooth structure on the lingual, and then where that gets opposed on the facial surface by the gingival one third. Now there we have two walls that can oppose each other and get some mechanical retention. But on the rest of the length of that preparation on say a central incisor, that whole facial part of the preparation, we've got a concavity behind there on the lingual, and so that's really not giving us much mechanical retention. So on a veneer, 
even if it's all the way on the facial, wraps interproximal, and goes over the incisal and wraps that as well, that's not giving us a lot of additional uh, mechanical retention. The only way to get mechanical retention on an anterior preparation like that is to prepare that gingival third and then that turns it into a full crown. The other thing about Ceramer, much like the resin modified glassionomers, is that it's white. It's a, it's a white cement. And so if you tried to use it under many veneers, it might show through. Sometimes you can see the outline of the prep through the crown. Bruxer probably won't show anything through there. You know, it's not quite that translucent and so you wouldn't see it coming through, but you could see it at the margins or something like that. And that's why most resin cements basically come in either Denton shades uh, or the translucent shades that I like to use just in case you do have a, a little bit at a thin margin so it doesn't show through. So that's really asking Ceramer to do something that it wasn't intended to do. And you're probably setting up the cement in yourself uh, for a clinical failure and probably been an upset patient if you were to cement eight of these on and then three of them fall off within four weeks or something like that. Um, it's controversial enough to even use something like a self-adhesive resin cement for veneers. Uh, something like a Reliax Unisem or Maxim Elite, or if you wanted to go one step up in strength and go to a self-etching resin cement, that would be Panavia F 2.0 or Multi-Link Automix. Both of those classes are self-etch based cements and that's you know controversial enough if that's enough retention to hold the veneers on. By and large, everybody placing veneers is still using a Total Etch or what's now called Etch and Rinse where we're etching, hopefully, uh, enamel, if it's a minimal prep veneer, or if it's not, if it's into the dentin, still kind of etching the dentin um, for the 10 seconds as we've done before, 15 seconds on any enamel that's there, and then placing the bonding agent uh, and the cement and putting everything uh, together. So I think it'd be controversial enough to go to either of those self-adhesive or the self-etching resin cements, let alone go all the way down to cementing. I don't, uh, nobody's really even suggesting that. There's a few people suggesting self-etch, and I would try that because I'm at the point in my career where I wanna use self-etch every time I'm in contact with a lot of dentin. And the only time I'm doing etch and rinse with the phosphoric acid uh, is when we are actually on enamel. So if we're doing some minimal prep veneers where 95% of the two structures in enamel, then I'm gonna go ahead and etch all that because we get such a good bond to enamel. So I have to say no, uh, asking me if I have any experience with it, and I certainly can't recommend it at all. Again, it's asking Saramer a, a fine cement to do something that it wasn't intended to do, much like if you wanted to try Reliax looting cement to put uh, veneers on as well. So just because Saramer has that natural bond to zirconia without the use uh, of a zirconia primer, the real issue here is the, is the bond strength enough of any of those cements, true cements, is it strong enough to the tooth to keep a veneer from coming off? And because veneer preps are not uh, mechanically retentive uh, at all, very low retentive preps, the answer is no, and it should not be used. So thank you for the question. Appreciate you writing in to ask that. I'm sure it's a question that's crossed the mind of some of our other dentists from time to time as well. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the case of the week. This is a pretty typical scenario of something that we see in our combination department. Again, what we refer to as a combo case is any case where we're going to be doing crown and bridge and a partial denture in conjunction with that. So uh, the doctor took a good impression for us and you can see we've got the prep here, got the tooth that the new crown is gonna be made on and that worked out fine. The problem really comes down to the pickup impression that we need to take for a case like that. So if we look at the model work that's here, you can see that uh, we've marked the rest preparation, the little area where part of the partial denture is going to stop and where it's going to sit. And when we seat the partial denture, onto the impression that the doctor took from us, we can see that all of a sudden we have a little issue here. And the issue is that this is not sitting in the rest where it should be. And so the and you can see when you look at this too that we've got a, a huge amount of space between the distal part of this crown and where the partial is. And that the lingual aspect of this clasp is unusually close to the prep itself. It would almost necessitate having a cast gold crown there. You almost couldn't fit a PFM there, and then we have an exceptionally large space over on the buckle as well. So in the laboratory, when our technicians put this partial onto the model, we can see that something shifted. If we look at this side, everything kind of appears to be where it should. It's a little difficult to tell from the detail of the pickup impression and the model that was poured, 
but it looks like that side of the partial is where it should be when we look at how on the lingual it butts up against the cervical part of that too. So it, it's clear that what happened was this partial shifted this side because the one area of contact, the one area of retention, this crown has been taken off and so now these clasp arms are floating in space and there's really nothing to prevent this from rotating to the distal or sliding down a little bit on the palate because of this. And so one of the tricks that I've done over the years to keep this from happening is when I've prepared a tooth like this, I'll put the partial denture into place and I'll verify that, for example, this lingual part is sitting here on the lingual of this tooth where it should be. And oftentimes I will just take some flowable composite and I'll just put a big bulk of flowable composite going from the enamel to the metal itself and then light cure it into place to kind of spot weld this partial into place because with this crown gone, there's nothing to keep this from rotating. In fact, without the flowable composite, you may even have this partial in the correct position but when you seat the impression tray over it, the viscosity of the pressure material could be what distorts the partial and kind of pushes it away from the teeth. So you really need a way to kind of spot weld that into place. Now, if there was a clasping back here on a molar and it was clasping onto that, you wouldn't have to worry about it. But it's when we've got one area of connection between the partial and the arch on this side that's now been destroyed because we've taken the crown off. We need to make sure we spot weld this so it won't move. But it's not uh, something where we completely have to start from scratch again. So here's what we're going to do. We're, we made a coping for the doctor, and I'll put it onto the model here. And you can see it's a coping that fits on the prep, and you can see the little spikes that we have on there coming out of this casting. And so how this is going to work is we're going to send this back to the doctor with the partial, and we're going to have him cement this coping into place on the tooth with very weak temporary cement. You can put a little Vaseline in there. Uh, you could use Duralon and a little Vaseline, anything you can put on there just to kind of locate this onto the prep so it's going to stay in place. And once the doctor temporarily cemented that onto the prep, he's going to reseat the partial. Now it's going to be in the correct position this time, so when he reseats it, he'll see this lingual part of the partial sitting in this depression, this rest prep on the lingual of that lateral incisor. And then what we need him to do is somehow connect the clasp to this coping, and we don't want to do it with impression material because we don't want it to move again. So we're going to have the doctor, while he can visually verify that this is seating correctly in the lingual, lingual spot here on that lateral incisor, take some cold cure acrylic, almost anything. You could almost use flowable composite, but you can use snap, uh, jet, Duralay, and you're actually just going to hook this coping to this clasp. And because it's going to get into the undercuts of these little arms, uh, when we take a pickup impression over this, it's all going to come out as one piece. The weak link will be the temporary cement with the Vaseline that's holding this coping down onto the tooth. So really all we're trying to do is take some acrylic and hook this clasp to this coping that's in place, let it hook onto those arms so that it stays in there when we take the impression. Then we're going to take a full arch pickup impression over this and then the partial will come out with the coping locked into place and he'll send that back to the laboratory. And now we will have a model that we can pour up with the accurate fit of the partial onto the patient's arch and an accurate fit between the clasp and the metal coping itself. This is going to give us the best chance for restorative success when the doctor has the patient back to try in the final crown and the partial itself. Like I said, Gordon and I made that snoring and sleep apnea DVD. And you know, when you talk, when I mention it at lectures, you still get a lot of kind of quizzical looks from dentists. It's something that was never taught in dental school. They kind of feel like they might be honing into the, the medical field and they don't feel comfortable with it. Uh, in reality, it's something that kind of slipped between the cracks from medicine and dentistry. But they're not, you really need somebody with kind of a, a go for it attitude or I want to learn more because it does seem so foreign to what we do in dentistry because we're not sticking people with a needle and hitting them with a drill. I really like your approach with this uh, with this testing method at home because it's more in an it's definitely more in an area where a dentist feels comfortable bruxism it's something right. they've observed something that they've treated it may they may have been frustrated with how nebulous the whole concept was and if what kind of splint am i doing this right is there a difference between maxillary mandibular and i like the idea that we're now kind of 
get, they're kind of getting backdoored into sleep, if you will, by looking at it as a bruxism device, and then, oh, by the way, here's this other AHI number, uh, and you can look at this and know this, and then maybe send it to this physician, this sleep person, and see what they have to say, and see if there's an issue. And oh, by the way, instead of making a splint for it, now you're just making a sleep appliance, a dorsal or whatever, or a tap that is not only gonna help with the bruxism, but also help open the airway, and I think it's a good way to kind of sneakily, not that it's being sneaky on purpose, but to kind of get Dennis into sleep through a more dental channel rather than having them step right. outside their comfort zone and start to approach sleep physicians and talk to them about let's have a partnership. That's exactly why we developed our course and that's why it's titled Bruxism Therapy and Dental Sleep Medicine because that is where dentists are comfortable. They're not comfortable in, most dentists are not comfortable in dental sleep medicine only and there is this big tie-in. Right. I mean, you know, the other point of it is, is this, and we've proven this with this monitor with all the testing that we've done. Um, Dennis, what, you probably, Glidewell probably has the best statistics in the world. You probably have dentists that send you the same Bruxism appliance no matter what the patient, right? But if the patient's got some risk factors where they may have obstructive sleep apnea and you make the wrong appliance, it shoves their jaw back, right. you've now just made their obstructive sleep apnea worse. Now, I can tell you, after almost 40 years in dentistry, you've been around a long time too, I've never seen a patient die from bruxism, right? right? But they do die from symptoms and problems with obstructive sleep apnea. Yep. You know, Reggie Miller, you know, famous linebacker yep. for the Green Bay Packers, obstructive sleep apnea. We, anything that we put in the mouth that changes that jaw relationships, which is only everything we put in the mouth, right. but especially a bruxism appliance, use the wrong bruxism appliance in, that shoves their jaw back, you've now made their problem worse. And you have no idea, and you say, hey, I'm just a dentist, what do I know? I'm just treating bruxism, uh-uh, not anymore. With what we know, you've got to know bruxism therapy, you've got to know how it relates. You don't want to do an oral appliance for obstructive sleep apnea? I don't know why not, right. they're really not that difficult to do once you understand some of the science. But I mean, I get dentists all the time after they take my course, they said, you know, I've made the same proximal appliance for every patient, right? right? I, I never thought about it. This testing in this monitor will make you change your whole thinking about, you know what? This proxima applies for this patient, that for that patient. No patient gets the same kind of treatment right. except in bruxism. And I feel like this right? is right in your wheelhouse. And, and Gordon said to me, what do you think it's going to take for this to become a really popular topic among general dentists? Because there's certain things, you know, Gordon's been saying for 20 years that dentists should be placing their own implants from 6 to 11 and 22 to 27. Right. And GPs have been very slow to start surgically placing implants. And the, he felt the same way kind of about this. He said, well, it seems like there's been kind of more snake oil with all the appliances that are out right. there. What do you think it's going to take before this uh, message gets to the masses? And uh, I didn't have an answer for him, but I think I do now. I think it's your group, well, the yeah. AAFE, because right. you guys specialize in taking things that appear to be very niche topics that, oh, Hard, who, what dentists are going to be interested in injecting Botox into their right. patients? Some people could say, and I probably thought that myself. And and now all of a sudden, you guys are just blowing this open, and you're teaching it in all 50 states, and uh, and it's huge. You can just see how popular and how full these courses are. You just keep adding more and more. And I hope with your guys understanding how to treat a topic like that and get it through to the dentist, that when you you know it probably wouldn't have excited you if this was just another at-home sleep right. study device. Exactly but when you right. saw it to the tie-in with bruxism and what you're doing with Botox, you probably realize this is a way to get it through to dentists. Hopefully, your group's gonna be the one who kind of brings this in and more people will uh, get treated for this because you know, Reggie White, I don't, I don't think it says ever obstructive sleep apnea on the death certificate. It's always a heart attack right, right, or, or right. something That's as a exactly result right. of it. But a, good, a practice management consultant who's a good friend of mine, his brother was getting ready to go in for surgery for obstructive sleep apnea. He just put it off for a month or two because of insurance and his brother ended up dying before he got a chance to have that surgery. So that's part of the reason why I've always taking it serious myself is knowing somebody who died from it. So hopefully you guys are gonna be the ones to bridge the, gra bridge the gap and be able to bring more GPs you know, into this and have them start treating it. Um, I know also that um, you wanted to talk a little about Medicare and, what yeah, it's, uh, and sure. how it's affecting dentists and what's going on with that. Tell me what's on your mind. Uh, not what's on my mind. This is what's on Medicare's mind. And this, this topic is, you want to talk about a foreign topic. <laughs> this is right. one that is really you know, driving the dentists insane, but it's something that we really have to take seriously here. And this was reported in the ADA News, so mm -hmm. don't, don't shoot the messenger here. You can take a look at the ADA News. May of 2014, Medicare came out with a ruling, mm -hmm. and it sounds like 
such a like uh, not something that's totally not important here but it's this kind of a ruling that a uh, a provider a medical provider and now they include dentists in that as well they've got to either opt in or opt out of medicare and we'll talk a little bit about what those mean because those, okay. those those terms you know if you don't speak the medicare language you know those terms are not exactly what they mean but they have to make a decision with medicare dentists included they either have to opt in or opt out by june 1st 2015. okay so that that sounds like a far a long time away, but that really is not as far as you may think uh, for that. And if dentists don't, if they do nothing at all, so there's opt in, nothing, opt out. If they do nothing at all and stay where they're at right now, then when they give a prescription to a Medicare beneficiary, who's any anybody over 65 and older who doesn't have private insurance has Medicare, there's only 50 million of them mm -hmm. in the United States. That's a lot of patients, right? Um, then their prescriptions will not be filled at the pharmacy. They can't get reimbursed. And that sounds so innocuous, right? That sounds like really no big deal. So, you know, dentists tell me all the time, well, I don't want to be part of Medicare. I'm going to do nothing and that kind of stuff. But when your Medicare geriatric patient goes to the pharmacy and can't get reimbursed for their medications, I don't care if it's $10, $20, $30, if you don't understand geriatric patients, they are not coming back to you. And right. they, they are literally going to walk out your door because that's the way geriatrics are. Right. And I'm closer to it than you are. Yeah, well, but when we get there, our generation may not be, but this is the generation of geriatrics who tell stories like, my dad tells stories about the depression right. and how they were so poor they couldn't afford a football, so they just took a milk carton and stuck it, stuffed it full of socks. Right. And that's what they used to use. I'm like, really? I want to see a picture of this because I don't believe this for a minute, old man. But you're right. That's kind of their, their viewpoint on things. So are you saying you can either opt in or out, but doing nothing does not automatically put you in the opt-out right. category? It, right. Doing nothing is will, your patients will get mad at you because they can't get things, uh, you know, they can't get them filled at the pharmacy and get reimbursed. But if you decide to have some kind of a relationship with Medicare, mm -hmm. and that would be by either choosing to opt in or opt out. Now, both of that, we could spend an hour and a half on each one of those and what those mean, so we won't. But all that means for right now is they have now have a relationship with Medicare. Okay, then Medicare, you know, you can, your patients will not leave you, they will get their prescriptions filled and all those different kinds of things. But for me, in my offices, and for a lot of the general dentists and AFE members that want to attract patients, because more geriatrics are doing more cosmetic dentistry, they're doing more implants than ever before, they're doing all those different things, I, I, I want to do it. Now, there are either opting in or opting out. There's all got different rules from that perspective here. But there are ways to go ahead and opt in that are pretty much painless for the dentist because there are Medicare does not pay for dental services. Pay right. for very, very few dental services that most general dentists are not going to go ahead and do. Now, that's relatively painless. So the big question that you or many, you know, the knee-jerk reaction that you and many, I don't know about you, but many dentists tell me right away, I don't want anything to do with Medicare. Medicare is a nightmare and that kind of stuff. Did you hear my knee hit right, the desk? I, I had a literal <laughs> knee-jerk reaction See, when that, you said that. that that's that's, that's crazy. I would not have expected it's that It's a knee-jerk reaction. It is. You know, I don't want to be... You're already in the Medicare system. That's what most dentists don't realize. Every dentist is in. You haven't established a relationship by right. opting in or but opting out. But they know out. who you are. But they know who you are right. because you, if you practice like I practice, you have something called an NPI number, yes, which is the National Provider Identifier number. That all was part of the Medicare system. Now, you, we didn't know that. Right. Nobody thought about that. They said, okay, you got to do this in 2002 or three, whenever it started. You got to do this. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to get paid. Insurance, yeah. Right? Yeah, or insurance, right. you got to do it. So everybody's got one. So dentists tell me, I don't want to be in Medicare. It's too late. You've been in Medicare. And don't give me the whole government plot thing. And maybe it is. I don't right. know. It doesn't make a difference. You're going to have to deal with it. And from a practice management perspective, even though it doesn't sound like a big deal, I get dentists tell me all the time, I don't care about my 65-year-old bat. Hey, send them to me. Right. I want to do those implants. They, they've they've had more money than they've ever had before. Right? right? They, they do the, they're doing the most dentistry. And that's great. They have more teeth than they've ever had before. In the year 1960, the average geriatric had four teeth. In the year 2000, they have 20 teeth. In the year 2025, when I'm a geriatric, right. they have full complement of teeth. They are the real growth area of dentistry. Send them all to my office. That's it. But now, you know, now, I, I've yeah. seen, I've seen, I can remember a couple <laughs> geriatric patients where um, all of a sudden a 74-year-old woman wanted veneers. 
Right. And we're like, wow. And I'm trying to figure out why. And my, my staff started laughing. I said, what? And they said, you don't know? And I said, no. And they said, her husband died right. two months she's, ago. She's I go, dating. I go, yeah. Right. And they go, well, <laughs> not that she's dating. Uh, maybe she's dating after the veneers. But it was just like, no, she told us she always wanted to do this. And her husband said, no, I love you just the way you are, which was there his way of being cheap right. and not letting her do something for her self-esteem. So as soon as he was gone, boom, it was, it was time for the veneers. And you're right. You would never expect it was going to be that old. And I get nervous um, you know, sometimes doing aesthetic dentistry on somebody young because you want it to last a long time, but they're going to abuse it. And I like the idea of doing it on somebody who's a little closer to the end, you know, because they might be able to take <laughs> those restorations to the coffin. Implants yeah, with them. too, that's, all those kinds of right, things. Right. I, okay. I don't know if you want to keep this in, but... Uh, no, 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 that's... Uh, yeah, we're <laughs> not... Just kidding. I think they know they're closer. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but, but that's not the point. The point is people are living longer. Right. That 74-year-old can live with veneers for another 20, 30 yeah, yeah, years. Yeah, Okay, sure. my mother is 90. She's got a whole complement of veneers that I did not put in when she was 20 because right. that would be physically impossible, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's true. but it's it, there. There's no question. That's it. And I'm going to go back to a point that you mentioned before. You don't know about our generation as we get into that thing. We'll all be cheap. We're all cheap now. The whole world is cheap with Amazon and everything else. You know, people complain to me. Dentists complain that patients are cheap. I said, because well, we're all cheap, right? right? You, nobody's buying what the first thing they see because it's easy to click on and get the best price, you know, in no time. Same thing, just about everything else. And I can tell you, just myself, as I'm getting older to that, you know, Medicare age, got a little ways to go. Right. But I can feel myself being like, you know, oh my God, you know, are, are my kids going to rip me off? Or is everybody going to rip me off? Well, it's almost just the principle off? of the thing. Right, it's, that's it, right. I know you don't need that's $15, right. but if you go somewhere and you can't get this paid for because it's $15 because you go to this particular provider who's not on Medicare, you know, you'd be like, oh, you know, it just, it's kind of like open table. Right. I, I do there open table reservations all the time. And last night we went to dinner at a place that was doing a thousand points uh, open table if you went to their restaurant at 530. And we did it because every time you get 10,000 open table points, they send you a hundred dollar dining certificate. You could use it anywhere. Wow. And I'm not usually the kind of person who puts out a lot of extra effort um, because that ends up just being like $10 off when you're going to dinner. I, I don't even, I don't really know the cost of gas or what it right. milk costs at the store sort of, but there's certain things kind of on principle where it's like, for some reason, I want to take advantage of this. And for that same reason, you could see going to a pharmacy, I've always felt this the same way. You know, it's nice. You feel good about your insurance regardless of what else happens right. if you go into a pharmacy and you get something for free uh, or a $5 copay or $10. Right. But if you have to pay the whole thing just because your provider decided to draw a line in the sand with Medicare, good luck. Right. I, I mean, that, that, that is exactly. I, I really call it the AARP syndrome, right? I mean, geriatrics are constantly bombarded. And I'm telling you, I'm, I, I'm already a member of the AARP. Right. Constantly bombarded. Everyone's trying to scam you. Everyone's trying to rip you off. Everybody's trying to do this. So, you know, now you're going to go to a dentist and uh, you like, you, like you said, dentist says, I don't care about Medicare. You know, so let them leave me. They will leave you right. because just on the principle of the thing, you know, that you didn't go ahead and do something that took care of them. They'll pay, and, you know, Dennis, uh, Dennis just emailed me last week and said, well, if that, if they're only worried about the $10, they're never going to do veneers and they're never going to do implants. It's not true. Right. People go nuts. I have friends who are billionaires. They get, go nuts on the $10, right? Uh, rather than, it's not about the money. Right. It's the, like you said, it's the principle of the thing. Right. And that's just the way that geriatrics are. My thanks to Dr. Lewis Mockmaker for that. If you look at the AAFE, the organization that he started, it's amazing how many courses they're putting on and how many dentists they're training. In fact, I had the occasion to speak with Dr. Gordon Christensen uh, just a couple days ago, and Gordon mentioned to me he had done some lectures uh, over in England, and he said you'd be really surprised to see how many dentists over there are using Botox for these types of purposes. I think he said almost 60% of the dentists over there are doing it now. So it's much, much bigger, much more widespread than it is here uh, in the United States. So certainly something that I'm going to take a closer look at. That about wraps it up for this uh, edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. I'm like, really? I want to see a picture of this because I don't believe this for a minute, old man.